Pamela McCall is an author, historian and vintage book collector currently touring America speaking about the poem Twas the Night Before Christmas's vibrant legacy at dozens of museums, bookstores and libraries. As the poem turns 200, McCall is presenting the poem's story in a new book, Twas the Night, the art and history of the classic Christmas poem. And Pamela is on the line with us here and you are of course touring America You're in this very nice hotel, are you? I've been on tour for 21 days, so I've seen a different hotel every night. (laughs) The eggs are getting a bit slim. (laughs) Yeah, that must be exciting, seeing all those different places, is it? Or is it a bit tiring? No, it's great. I mean, you know, what's interesting is the Americans have their Thanksgiving, and I think they literally put their dishes in the dishwasher and turn on the Christmas lights. (laughs) It's like, poof, it's Christmas everywhere. Wow. unbelievable. And then, of course, they do Black Friday. Oh, yeah, that must have been exciting. What do you think? it is about Twas the Night Before Christmas that captures our imagination so much? I think it's the rhythm of it, of course, but I also think it's just this magical thinking, right, of a tiny little elf showing up with all these reindeer and bringing presents. And, you know, it has such good spirit about it. There's no naughty or nice. There's no birch and rod. No one's going to get beat up if they didn't behave properly or get, you know, hurled a, you know, piece of coal. Yeah. Um, I think that that was really the big thing, because before this poem, that's kind of how children Christmas poems were written they always had this threat yeah. <laughs> of, a, of the birch and rod being sort of brought out or you know something terrible happening <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it's a poem that we all know and we've all heard but I don't think most of us really know the history of it do we right well I mean it's a jovial merry little poem so yeah. one wouldn't think that somebody could write a 264 page <laughs> you know, with extensive footnotes. (laughs) But it's a huge piece of history because it's the American Revolution and it's the American Civil War um, because that's the era of the poet. But it also goes to the third century because you've got St. Nicholas who straddles the third and fourth century and the Roman Empire. And then you've got to work your way, you know, with the legend, which is anonymous giving at night because St. Nicholas arrives and throws gold into the windows of a home to save some girls from being put into slavery. Um, That's where the story starts from. And then it morphs, you know, through the centuries um, and then ends up in America and Manhattan. And when you first came up with the idea to write this book, did you know that there was going to be a lot of history in it? Well, not as much as (laughs) I found there was. And so it kind of took over my life and it took years to do. Um, I thought it was going to be more the life of Clement Seymour, the poet of Christmas Eve from yeah. Manhattan. But it, you're right, it, it turned into something much, much more. <laughs> yeah. And what were the kind of things that surprised you along the way? I think it's just the number of people that were involved in the poem, because at that time in New York in 1822, Christmas was celebrated in a very vibrant, um, I would say, violent way mm. on the streets. There were guns going off and there was lots of rowdiness and sort of Saturnalia style of behavior um, and lots yeah. of drinking. And, uh, you know, there's a huge murder <laughs> murder count. <laughs> so <laughs> I think there was a real endeavor to bring Christmas back into the home um, and sort of get it under control. <laughs> so it wasn't just Moore who was involved in that. It was Washington Irving and a lot of other people who wanted to see Christmas sort of become something that was not only less violent, but also um, more denominational. So everybody could get included. There's so much history there that you wouldn't really expect. So what first gave you the idea to write this? book and what got you interested in Twas the Night Before Christmas in the first place? Well, in 2012, I published the poem and I took away Santa's smoke um, and his pipe. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it became a really big media firestorm around the world. You know, the uh, BBC and the Scotsman on Sunday, you know, did it. Um, <laughs> you know, it went everywhere. It was on late night, you know, talk shows. It was you know, circulating all over this debate as to, you know, how dare you touch, you know, a classic like this. But yeah. um, I did it for a really good reason. And I and I stand by what I did. Um, because I think a lot of children in the Department of um, Health of the UK yeah. in 2012, they did a study of a thousand children and they asked them what they thought about Christmas and they all had parents that smoked. And these thousand children told the Department of Health that they really would give up their Christmas presents if Santa could help, you know, their parents quit smoking. Wow. And so... I decided that they deserved a smoke-free edition because I just thought 
if this little five-year-old is writing a letter to Santa Claus saying, hey, all I want, all I want this Christmas is for you to get my parents to quit smoking because I worry that they're going to die and leave me alone. Um, I thought that little kid deserves to have this poem without bumping into Santa Claus smoking, right? <laughs> like, like how to blow your dream, you know? So yeah. that's why I did it. And when you wrote yeah. that smoke-free version of the poem, there was a bit of a backlash from some people, wasn't there? I guess it's because it's such a classic poem that if you dare touch it, it's like touching the crown jewels or something. It is. I mean, I was called a literary vandal. I was called um, disturbing, disgusting by you know some major librarians. And I was accosted. I was in a library signing my book and a man walked up to me and picked up my book and bopped me on the head and called me a heretic. No. And I got hate mail from an elf. I am um, the New York, the New York Post, a major, major American newspaper. They um, called me and I said, "I'm getting hate mail." And they said, "What does it say?" And I, it says, um, "The only wreath we want to see this Christmas is one on your grave." And it was signed, "The head elf of the snowman factory." Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> So it was crazy, but it also gave me a platform. You know, I've been to the United Nations, I've been to the um, United Nations twice because wow. I, 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 it afforded me a platform, which was great. Yeah, there's no such yeah. thing as bad publicity, I guess. <laughs> no, just when you get hit on the head. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Well, this book that you've got now took you ten years to mm-hmm. write, didn't it? What took and, you so long? Well, I had to travel around because I had to go see all these collections. Like one of the huge collections is in Oklahoma, um, yeah. and I went there in the middle of a storm they have tornadoes um that was interesting the man keeps his collection in a vault so that it doesn't get blown away and taken up like something out of wizard of oz <laughs> um yeah, so they had to travel um we also had covid so it was really hard to get into some archives um that yeah. kind of slowed me down um and i also wanted to not only read the writings of people like washington Irving and charles dickens but i wanted to get to know them and so i read journals and obituaries and all these things and i discovered all kinds of fun things like washington irving who is sort of the he's really important to the Santa Claus story because he wrote about him in 1809 25 times in Knickerbocker the very famous book but yeah. Charles Dickens loved Washington Irving and a lot of the influence from Dickens Christmas Carol comes from Washington Irving but if you back it up Washington Irving was highly influenced by Sir Walter Scott so when yeah. so when Washington Irving comes over to Scotland to visit at Abbotsford Sir Walter Scott kind of turns him on to um, ghost stories and German folk tales and, and all kinds of sort of um, superstitions right so yeah. Yeah, so that's why it took me so long was because I didn't just um, do sort of a superficial thing. I actually read all that Washington Irving wrote about Sir Walter Scott's visit, you know, all these things, right? Yeah. So because then you can put it together in a better way because so many things in life and in literature and art are connected, right? You know, people don't just work in vacuums. You know, they're influenced by other people. And and um, I think that's really the interest of a cultural history like this. That you've got to bring those threads together. It's interesting because our, a lot of our f- famous Christmas stories from a similar time of around 200 years ago. True. There was a real push to sort of start bringing it into the home and off the yeah. streets. And uh, I mean, Charles Dickens comes along with Christmas Carol 20 years after Twas. Yeah. Yeah. You know, kind of fun. You know, and, yeah. and I say, I mean, Washington Irving and Charles Dickens invented Christmas dinner, but Clement <laughs> Moore invented Christmas Eve, you know, uh-huh. with, and Santa Claus yeah. with all the trimmings and the reindeer and, and all of this. What was Christmas before all that? Because the magic of Christmas and the Christmas dinner are like one of the two biggest things of it. Sure. I mean, the 12 days of Christmas, of course, Queen, you know, Elizabeth the first, I mean, you know, everybody, 12 days is a, is a long, sort of has a long, long history, but this idea of an elf flying around on Christmas Eve, <laughs> You know, with a reindeer, yeah. you know, that's American. And that's, yeah. you know, 200 years ago. Yeah. Which yeah. is so magical, right? I mean, it's just the whole world celebrates Santa Claus. They do. Because when yeah. my story hit about the smoke-free Santa, it was Googling in China. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, and India, you know, went to Bombay, Brisbane, it went everywhere, you know. So everybody's interested in Santa Claus for sure. Yeah. It's interesting because there was that kind of backlash, but if it was the night before Christmas was to be written now, do you think it would include a smoking Santa in the first place? Well, they're still publishing editions with a smoking Santa who's smoking all over the cover, which 
Yeah. Knowing what we know, right, about the influence of imagery of cartoon characters. I mean, it's illegal to have Joe Campbell, right? Yeah. Because it influences children to sympathize them towards these, normalizes them towards these products. But sure, people still do additions and they're smoking all over it. And I just kind of go, you know, we are in the 21st century. Yeah. <laughs> and I think there's some things that we need to change. <laughs> and was it always your intention to release this book around the 200th anniversary of the poem. It was, but you know what's really interesting is I've been in five states and I've been to dozens of museums and galleries and I'm the only person holding the balloons right now. Like, this is the most famous poem ever written in the English language. It's the most yeah. published work in the Library of English Literature, right? <laughs> Which is kind of mind-blowing. And a lot of people are celebrating the bicentennial next year because that's when it was first published. Yeah. But I think the writing of it needs to be celebrated too. And, and Clement Seymour, you know, this really interesting family. And I just so, I, but I'm out here, you know, holding the balloons. I, I, I've just, yeah. I've been shocked that more people haven't been, because when you see things like Alice in Wonderland or Winnie the Pooh, and they have milestones. It's a big deal. Yeah. But for some reason, twas, although it's loved all over the world, um, this anniversary is not getting, I think, the, the, the attention it deserves. But why not celebrate it in the year when it's released? Because you would celebrate the anniversary of a famous bridge opening in the year that it was completed or whatever. Is it because 1822 is probably the night before Christmas that it's about? I think it's because Clemency Moore's home in Chelsea was torn down and thrown into the Hudson River and the 1850s and there's no museum for him there's no statue no statue which is really interesting yeah there's a statue of mother goose in the middle of central park <laughs> no there's no clemency moore <laughs> statue kind of funny right yeah um so i you know i think that that's part of the problem um you know museums are so wonderful when you can go to an actual home like i was at mark twain's home speaking yeah and you can go there and you can imagine what christmas is like in the home of mark twain and and you can get into it so but there's not there's nothing like that for clemency more. There's no Twas the Night Before Christmas Museum. You know, there's nothing. So, And you're currently in the middle of this tour of America. Right. What are you talking to people about? Uh, really sharing the history of the poem, how it came to be written, and then the art, because I'm an art major. And so um, I went and collected every single, it's a 264 page art history book, really, because yeah. every single page has art. Yeah. And it's not only the vintage illustrations, which are spectacular, um, but it's a lot of the art that people like Andy Warhol and Norman Rockwell and 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 people like that who didn't illustrate the poem but loved it and were inspired to do something with it. So, you know, Andy Warhol did not illustrate the poem, but his yeah. myth series in 1981, he includes it. He includes Santa Claus. And do you find that people are coming along with a big interest in the poem? Because, of course, it is part of our lives. But as I said at the start, we don't really know the history of it. I mean, are people mm -hmm. interested to know the history? They are. And you know who's really interested is the seven-year-old grandfather because they're reading it now to their grandchildren, but they read it as children. And so they have yeah. this, this, this nostalgic, sentimental attachment to the poem. And so I see them come up to me and they buy six copies. Like, it's amazing. They're, they're wow. by far the most interested. And you know what's so wonderful about that? is that if these grandparents then turn around and read it to their grandchildren, those children then have it in childhood, tied up with Christmas memories and grandparents, and they'll love it like we all do, and then they'll carry it on, right? So yeah. that's wonderful news um, to me, because that means the poem's going to carry on, which it should. Yeah. Well, what else is coming up for you? Have you got even more books that you've got planned yet? I'm 64 years old, and I'd love to work on this twice for a while. Um, I, I could do Dickens, because the art of Dickens, because Dickens was very involved with the illustrators in yeah. his in his publications. He worked very closely with them, um, which I think is really interesting for a writer. And there's so much wonderful art that goes with Dickens. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, it would be fun to do. Um, I just don't know. You know, I don't know. Um, I, I think the interest is there because Dickens is so huge. I just actually was at um, Ballancourt in Massachusetts and I went to the one man play of um, Gerald Charles Dickens. Um, Charles Dickens's great great grandson, who does a oh. one man show. He wow. was at High Clear, High Clear Castle, um, down to Nappy. Oh, yeah. in England but then he came to Massachusetts and so I got to see him which was really fun yeah 
And the whole time I was sitting there listening to, I was listening to his performance of Charles Dickens thinking, I wonder if I should do this book. I wonder if I should do this book. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. How are you spending Christmas this year as well, once you've finished this tour? Well, I have a, a granddaughter who's 13 months old and I'd love to be home for Christmas. Um, but we have to see because it is a very big project and yeah. um, I could be in New York because on Christmas Eve, uh, there's a tradition of walking children and families of a parish in Trinity church walk to his grave and place a wreath on it so and they read the poem with candlelight which i would love to do um if i don't do it in 2022 i'll do it in 2023 um but uh, it's kind of macabre i mean i don't know i'm going to grave sites isn't something i often do but um you know there's no statue so i guess we have his grave (laughs) (laughs) that's <laughs> right. true maybe we should maybe we need a statue hey <laughs> yeah get the campaign going yeah get the campaign going now the book is called Towards the Night The Art and History of the Classic Christmas Poem is it a good Christmas gift I think so because <laughs> the, you know I kind of designed it as a Christmas gift um, <laughs> the reason is that you can turn any page and look at the beautiful art and then yeah. you, if you're interested in reading then you can we don't have to you know so you could be any yeah. age like you could put it on your coffee table in your family and a child might find it interesting to look through it you know or as I said these grandparents who are you know really into this poem in a really big way um, might really enjoy reading about it well where are all the places that we can find the book Barnes and Noble Amazon I just sent my brother lives in um, Edinburgh and I just sent my brother through um, Amazon um, UK a copy of my book Uh Um, he's very he's a scholar and he's interested in Sir Walter Scott and everybody Robbie Burns and so um, I sent him a copy so that was easy and it didn't cost any more than it did from America didn't cost any more than sending a book here. So the, I thought that was really great. The price yeah. is the same. Well, many thanks for talking to us today. It's been great to have you on the show. Great. Thanks. Okay. Bye. <laughs>